Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here. It's uh, my birthday this week. And I kind of claim the whole uh, month of December because everyone is so busy with holiday preparations and parties and the like that, uh, you know, I got so many friends that, oh man, I missed your birthday, can we get together? And it's like, yeah man, as far as I'm concerned, it's my birthday till December 31st. So uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to this and uh, more podcasts coming this month of Word Balloon. Questions or comments about the show, john at wordballoon.com. Please reach me via email. Uh, that's the way to do it. And uh, follow me on Twitter under John Word Balloon. Follow me on Facebook under my name, John Suntress. Thank you very much for listening to the commercials. I know that they uh, sometimes repeat the same commercials. Out of my hands, that is uh, my fine network spreaker selling the product. I thank them very much. I thank you for your patience in listening to repeat commercials till we get to the good content of Word Balloon. The good stuff is coming in one more minute. Thanks a lot for listening. Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here. The Batman Brave and Bold cartoon series is 10 years old. That's just insane. I can't believe it, man. I remember when it first came out, and uh, of course there was a little backlash about the Batman Brave and Bold series, because we had the great animated series, we even had the Batman, which was a little lighter than the animated series. Uh, but I think people were kind of um, nervous about having a fun, humorous Batman Brave and Bold, and it kind of harkened back to the Batman 66 tone, and a little more light with the villains, and a little more light at times with the heroes as well. But a lot of good things came of it. And uh, man, I'll tell you, from the start, and it was an incredible compliment to me that someone from Warner Brothers said, hey, the very even both producers would lo really love to talk to you on Word Balloon. I was stunned. James Tucker, Mike Jelenic, uh, who, as you know from uh, subsequent interviews, especially in the case of James Tucker, massive fan of what he's done in the DC animated universe, uh, both with the feature films and the television series. I really loved Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes, which is a series they did before doing Brave and Bold. And, uh, man, I'll tell you, uh, and Mike Jelanek, good lord, not only in the DC Universe, but uh, I was not a Thundercats person. I was a little too old to get into Thundercats when they first came out. And Mike wrote this incredible season of Thundercats, very adult in tone, very, very cool. Uh, my uh, good buddy Chuck, uh, who is a great uh, guy from USP, uh, UPS, he, he kind of sucked me into Thundercats, and I'm like, all right, this is actually good. He's like, I'm telling you, if you're into this stuff, you're going to like it. And that's how Chuck talks, by the way. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I wanted to go back and represent my first conversation with James Tucker, with Mike Jelenic. They were the showrunners for Batman Brave and Bold. I love their philosophy on the Batman character for Batman Brave and Bold. I'll let you listen for uh, yourself. Plus, um, this was around the time that they had a great crossover with the, the uh, Justice Society. I'm a sucker for the Golden Age, man. I love the, the Ju Justice Society, their original inception. I wasn't a big fan of Earth 2 when they kind of tried to reboot the Justice Society as kind of a modern team. Although it became its own continuity, and now looking back, I respect what they did with the Earth 2 series. But I'm telling you, Golden Age, I love those designs of the costumes. I love the idea that they're the first generation of heroes and kind of the mentors to subsequent hero generations. I love what happened in JSA, so it was really great to see the JSA in cartoon form, the real JSA. Uh, and of course, as you know, you know, James and Mike go back to the animated series as far as their associations with the DC animated universe. So this is a really good uh, look back, uh, celebrating the 10 years of Batman and the Brave and Bold cartoon series. And uh, after the interview with James and Mike, I wanted to in add, uh, add this uh, Paley Center red carpet event that they did. Um, I, I did present the red carpet interview I did with Andrea Romano on uh, that uh, repeat of uh, talking to her over the years uh, just a couple weeks ago. So I cut that out. But instead, you got James reflecting back. This is great because really we're talking to James in the first season of Brave and Bold. And then we get a chance years later on the Paley Red Carpet to look back. And he has a lot of interesting insight. In addition to that, we talked to uh, John DiMaggio, who was hilarious as Aquaman. Hey, I love what Jason Momoa has done with the character. I'm thrilled with the love that Aquaman is finally receiving that he richly deserves, not only in the uh, film, but also Kelly Sue DeConnick's current run on the series. But uh, John reminded us how much fun Aquaman could be with his very boisterous, regal, uh, very funny 
uh, take on uh, Aquaman. And then Dietrich Bader, one of the great Batman, and of course uh, reprising his role now on the Harley Quinn animated series. So pretty cool, man. Those three interviews uh, will be after this first interview with James Tucker and Mike Jelenic. We're talking Batman Brave and Bold on today's Word Balloon, brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you greatly, League, for your support via Patreon. Uh, Patreon.com slash Word Balloon. That's where the Patreon page is. I say it all the time, but I mean it. Word Balloon is free. It'll always be free. But if you like what you hear here and, you know, you want to help out the cause and subscribe to Word Balloon, do you think Word Balloon's worth a dollar a month to you? Is it worth the price of a comic book a month to you? If you think so, you like what you hear and you want to help out, Patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Thank you greatly for your support. League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. They're having a year of reading dangerously, as they call it, and they're backing it up with some tremendous books. Uh, People like Matthew Clickstein's You Are Obsolete. It's a very funny, great horror story. You'll appreciate the humor and the ideas when you mix children children of the corn with today's uh, social media and what happens to the kids when they take control of the small European town. There's Dark Red from Tim Seeley, a great Midwestern vampire story. Uh, When they're not in a big city, how does a vampire survive? Tim has been exploring that, and it's a pretty fun series. There's uh, Dark Ark from Cullen Blunt, Bun and Blun, Cullen Bun and Juan Doe, uh, taking place in biblical times. Uh, Noah's Ark, uh, the Odyssey continues. Uh, there's more than just the Bible story there. Pretty cool stuff. Marguerite Bennett's Animosity, Donny Cates' Baby Teeth, uh, Phil Hester and Ryan Kelly's Stronghold, to name a few other great things. Walk Through Hell from Garth Ennis. So many great series from Aftershock with uh, creators you know and trust with great genre-bending ideas that uh, go beyond the norms of comic books. Check it out for yourself. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on how to order these books and more through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. All right, let's get into it now. Brave and Bold Talk with Mike Jelenic and James Tucker back when the show was brand new. This conversation took place almost 10 years ago, January of 2010. It's uh, the Brave and Bold producers on today's Word Balloon. It was really interesting to read on uh, IMDb your past credits because um, I wasn't sure if this was your... (laughs) What's that? That are correct are the ones that are you know erroneous. But go ahead. Yeah. Well, you tell me because it seemed like um, you guys had been doing a lot of work in Warner's animation and specifically in the superhero world leading up to this Brave and Bold series. Why don't you tell me, guys, uh, Michael? Why don't we start with you and uh, you know tell me some of the other superhero shows that you've worked on? Yeah, you know it's funny because when I came to Warner Animation, probably in 2003, I really didn't have that big of a background in comics so i'm like the opposite of james and uh i was sort of thrown into the the batman world which out of all the sort of characters i knew the uh the most of i knew you know most his rogues and and whatnot but uh since i've been here i've slowly been getting onto more and more obscure properties so you know after batman i I went on to legion which i i knew legion of superheroes which i barely knew anything about and you know that that universe has like a thousand characters of the most bizarre uh people and then you know transitioning from that over to uh batman brave and the bold it's basically been you know it's like topping ourselves trying to find characters that uh you know most people have never heard of so it's it's i've, I've gotten a pretty good education in the comic book world since uh being here i think the great thing this is james uh it, it, I think it's to the credit of the shows that M- Michael doesn't know shit about uh, <laughs> comics. <laughs> and I'm the comic book geek. So, because I find in the past I've worked with comic book writers who become writers for uh, cartoons. And there's a little hesitance to go toward the cheese that is that is that can be in comics. Sure. Michael has no preconceived ideas about using, you know, Starro or, you know, Rainbow Batman or all the goofy... <laughs> You know, Batman of Zur and R, and you know, I mean, all that really goofy stuff that a lot of comic book, you know, writers and try to get away from, <laughs> or, or think we've outgrown. I mean, but, it, but that's fun stuff. And he, any time I throw out something, he's he's runs with it, which I love. He's really easy working with him in that respect. So. I get to react to stuff that James says, like I, you know, literally haven't heard of Haunted Tank before, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> If he says haunted tank, my my mind goes in a million directions. But now it's it, the irony is like you tell haunted tank doesn't seem like a, a weird right. character at all. So Not at all. 
I become jaded to uh, right, yeah. <laughs> the bizarreness. Well, you know, say, okay, imagine if Denver Pyle from the Dukes of Hazard was a, a Confederate soldier and he inhabited this tank from World War II. You know, I mean, if you break it down, if I break it down into 80s iconography, he gets it like that, you know. <laughs> Oh, it's great. It's like he's a great fan of 80s television. <laughs> That's my point of reference, right. Alf and Charles. Right, and, and mine is kind of a, like a generation ahead of that, you know, late 60s, early 70s uh, DC comics. So, so well, that's, that's how we come up with the, the energy that that comes with Batman, the Brave and the Bold. But I, we kind of maybe sidetracked you from your train of thought there. <laughs> Not at all. And actually, you've gone into an area that I want to get into because that is the brilliance, I think, as an older viewer of the show – because I grew up reading those six late sixties and early seventies uh, right, co- yeah. comic books as well, so uh, that is the fun. And you guys have managed to take what, on the surface, can look very hokey to today's audience. If you go back and read those old Dick Sprang Batman's, as you say, but you guys have brought that look with a modern sensibility. And and also, we I guess we have to include Andrea Romano too. Who is she? Very involved in casting? Oh yeah, she's uh yeah. I mean, totally okay. Because I think I think it's that combination that makes uh, us older viewers excited, but also your guys writing and directing as well uh, makes it palatable for this younger audience, and it, it works on all levels. and And I've watched it with little kids, and they've enjoyed it. And again, being an adult, I appreciate the action and the nods to these characters. Which, and again, I guess because James, you're a fan too, you're, you're spot on with your characterization of a lot of these guys. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm trying not to use all the cliches I've come up with over the course of doing interviews, but I'll, I'll fall on a couple. I, I did it for nerd parents and their offspring. <laughs> and I wanted to make the show I thought I was seeing when I was watching Adam West Batman and the 68, uh, 60s Spider-Man show. You bet. And, you know, even the um, the uh, Spider-Man is Amazing Friends or, you sure. know, I mean... When you're a kid, your six your inner six year old sees a whole other show than what's actually on the screen, <laughs> and you'll be eighty years old defending that show to people <laughs> saying I, that. So I thought, well, let's make a show at least that would give them some some uh, you know ammunition to defend it. <laughs> you know, so when they are eighty and they're saying Batman: Brave and the Bold was a good show, actually make it a good show because <laughs> you know, I mean, most people defend shows that, quite frankly, are embarrassing. <laughs> On life, it's like you know. I mean, there's guys who hate our show, but they'll look at reruns of GI Joe like it's The Wire or something. <laughs> oh, I mean, I just want to make a show that actually holds up in a few years when someone's you know probably too old to really have been watching it. But you know, so that, that's kind of what we we try to make it good, but we also want to own. Embrace the cheese that is inherent yeah. in a lot of it, you know. And it's not bad. It's, I mean, for a long time, and I think you know, rightfully so. Every superhero show after Batman, um, Adam West Batman, thought that was the way you did superhero shows. Sure. So that kind of got a bad rap. But that show in and of itself is brilliant, in my opinion, and it really did. It got more right than wrong. But um, the only problem was it spawned a lot of copycats and bad, you know, campy versions of trying to do that version of Batman or that version of superheroes. And uh, so we just kind of went back to that and just, you know, did it with a straight face. So, Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, just last week we had our, 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 a teaser with Batman versus Enemy Ace. And to me, I feel like that teaser sort of sums up the show, uh, yeah. you know, because it, it, we put Batman in World War One. We don't explain how he got there. He's in a bat <laughs> biplane. Right. But, you know, we don't explain that. He's wearing goggles. <laughs> No and scarf. a scarf. Thanks to Michael, because I didn't want him to wear the scarf, but I'm glad we did it. <laughs> and yet, you know, you watch that teaser, it's, it's it's fairly serious. There's no music. The sound design is, like, excellent. And and so you're you're left watching, like, all these things that should be goofy. We're presenting them, like, in, in a non-sort of goofy and serious way. And so you're almost unsure how to react. And, and I think that's sort of, like, the enjoyment of the show. It's like you... you like you guys are saying, you take right. the cheese seriously. It's like, well, take this, it how we used to take it. I mean, the idea is I love DC Universe, like across the board. I have no favorites. I love it all. So, <laughs> and Batman, I think, to the wider world is the touchstone for DC. Like, everyone thinks they know Batman. You know, he's he's the normal guy. He's the human. 
who doesn't have superpowers, but he's very resourceful. I mean, he he's to me he's more representative of the American ideal than say Superman is, even though Superman gets that label a lot more. But um, so if, if you have Batman in it, and he has a straight face, and no matter what he's up against, if he's out in space, under sea, under the sea, <laughs> no matter where you put him, as long as he buys it, and he's not rolling his eyes or saying that's you know bogus, then the audience will embrace it and. Using him as a conduit to the greater DC universe, I think, is really the only way you could do it. I don't even know if a, a Superman show like this would work, although I'd give it a shot. Well, but, and, I, uh, and I remember in the 90s, they did kind of do a Superman team-up. Yeah, in, DC Presents, yeah. Yeah, well, not only in the comics, but also animated. It seems like that last stand Oh, well, season. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I was there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. They, they had guest stars occasionally on Superman, and... And that, you know, and this show kind of takes cues from that because we never explained how he knew Doctor Fate or um, <laughs> I forget who else we had on there, but yeah, with, with, they toyed with that on that show a little bit, having him have guest stars. Yeah, but it, it worked, and um, but but I agree with you that I think, um, and again, the title itself, "The Brave and Bold." I mean, once Batman took that magazine over. It, sure. it, it really was, and it had its own continuity, and there never needed to be an explanation, and it's fine, because they are all part of the DC Universe, and that was the more fun, exciting part of it, and again, you guys capture that magic. The Commandy episodes have been great. It was oh, yeah. it was great to see the the uh, pre-title sequence uh, with uh, the Challengers of the Unknown. Yeah, that was a lot of fun to do, because I, I, you know, going into it, I, I wanted, it's like, well, what if the Challengers had had their own TV show in the 60s? And Hanna Barbera had done it, or Filmation. What would it look like? So we referenced, uh, you know, Young Samson and uh, Mitor and you, Johnny Quest. Johnny Quest, and there was a Filmation show that I'm I'm drawing a blank on now. Um, micro Team or something, anyway. Um, and we just YouTube those main titles. <laughs> uh, I think Herculoids is the one we were we were closest to, but um, those titles were great. So anyway, we came up. We didn't have to do that. We could have just started the teaser on Dinosaur Island and just went into it. <laughs> it's those little geeky touches we like to do, the what if factor of the show. You know, act. You know, as if the show existed in the '60s. You know, the show I would have wanted to see when I was a kid. You know, watching cartoons and you know saying, "Oh, I wish they'd do it like they did in the comic." You know, so. But then you know, stuff like those little flourishes we do. You know, it's, it's also just a fun way to sort of get exposition. You know, sure. you know, another show might have explained each character and what they did and who they are, because you know we're meeting all these characters for the first time. And you know, no, if you don't know who the challengers are of the no, unknown are, you might be left in the dark. So you know, I thought you know we we, we constantly are doing trying to do stuff like what's a clever way of of getting that exposition and bringing the audience up to speed. Yeah, without doing the dossier type of. You know, yeah, certainly the Batman in the Batcave. Yeah, I mean, you you know, you have to know. I think it's more important to know who the person is as a personality than to know all his backstory. You know, we kind of you know with comics these days, there's kind of a who's who, sure, or a you know who's who in the Marvel universe. Well, you bet. You literally have a, a Rolodex of <laughs> or of their you know what's their power level, and where, <laughs> what's their origin, and where did they come? You know, and people think that that's character if you know all that. <laughs> about him and it's really not no if you tell a, if you can let the audience know what kind of person this guy is that goes a lot long a, a lot further to letting the audience in on on enjoying that character because we're not really you don't fall in love with the character based on their backstory you could you can fall in love with them based on their how are they reacting to things and who who is what's their personality and I think the thing we like to do on this show is make sure everyone has a strong personality which you know, bug some people. Like some people don't like Aquaman as being the the lovable but somewhat oafish <laughs> king of the sea. But he didn't have a personality before that. You know, he he wasn't. And I remember I just listened to your interview with Dan Slott where he was talking about the JLA if they were on the bus <laughs> or a train that got caught in a tunnel and <laughs> wouldn't know who they were. Yes, that was a you know that's you know I love DC because they're icon you know they're icons. And they have a, there's a lot more freedom for interpretation, but there is a problem with them being all of the same cloth. And the up, same voice. No, I totally agree. Voice. Literally, in some cases, you, yes. know, you go by the animation. But uh, Yeah, some of those old Super Friends or even those 60s uh, Filmation cartoons, I agree with you. Yeah, they were just interchangeable. And, yes. Um, 
so on this show we try to give each character a pushed, distinct personality that's that's in keeping with who they are as a character. I mean, Aquaman acts like a king. He's just, you know, he's not the perfect kind of person that people tend to, comic book fans in particular, love to have characters who are un, that have no flaws. It's almost like they want yeah. them to be like the purpose, perfect person. It's okay if every other character has flaws, but they don't want that guy to be, you know, you know, have have a have a have foibles basically. Certainly. So, and for this show to work, everyone's got to have a distinct personality to bounce off of Batman. So, you know, and it it also leads to the humor, the but it's affectionate humor. I don't think we're making fun of anybody, uh, character wise. You know, but um, I agree. And also, real quick, I want to know about the. Uh Coming up with the idea of doing this uh, pre-titles, you know, James Bond sort of, you know, intro before you get to the the main story. It's it's wonderful because it's a chance to expose so many characters. And I mean, my God, when you take out the commercials, you guys are dealing with between twenty and twenty-two minutes of story, yeah. and the amount of characterization, action, dialogue, everything that you guys are able to put in, it's incredible. And and I mean, really. God, go back to those old Johnny Quests, and as much as we like them, uh, you know, those things, you know, you can, you know, mark the time with an hourglass as opposed to a stopwatch sure. with the yeah. slow pace of those things. Well, the thing I, you know, I mean, I came into working at Warner's on the Superman show, and and then, you know, those, the Bruce Tim and Alan Burnett produced mm-hmm. shows, and um, they really had revolutionized how you treat a half hour, you know, cartoon. Because prior to that, well, Johnny Quest did it, but, you know, I mean, they really made the time stretch. You know, they wanted, they did it like a drama. The pacing was slower. You know, you started out with the security guard at a desk, and he hears something, and then he gets knocked out, and then you see the villain, and then, you know, the villain steals, I mean, Batman. You know, I mean, there was definitely a, a formula to it, a great formula, but, you know, it was very structured and very methodical and kind of, I say slow to get going to for my um, attention span. Like Scoopy Doo, like those old Scoopy yeah. Doo's too. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I was like, you know, well, we w- let's see how much story we can fit in 22 minutes. And I'm a DC fan, and I said if we if we let the teaser only lead into the main story of the show, that means that's so if we get if we do 13 episodes, that's 13 less heroes I can <laughs> play with. <laughs> I was like, well, let's make the teaser totally separate. Basically, do a short featuring Batman and this character, and then let the rest of the show be a whole other story. And really, purely, it came about because I just, again, have a short attention span. <laughs> I wanted to be able to play with as many of these characters as possible, and um, that was the only. And I, I'm a fan of the short form, like the idea that you know, on Space Ghost, you had a, two Space Ghosts and a Dino Boy. Yeah. It, and I'm like, those were stories. They had beginning, middles, and ends. Nobody felt they needed to see a whole Space Ghost adventure for a half hour. You know, no one felt cheated. True. Like, you know, there's a certain, there's only so much you have to have to tell a story. And it doesn't have to extend a full 22 minutes. And I'm, you know, I think our stories are very layered for what, you know, for the way we do them. And we managed to fit a three-act story without, you know, without, we, we, our teasers typically are two to three minutes, yeah. I think. I mean, the teaser, I, you know, at first the, the teaser is like a huge challenge, at least from, yeah. from the writing uh, aspect, because, you know, like, like James is saying, you do a teaser that's completely unrelated to the story, that's uh, three minutes less you can you do know, focus the, yeah. on developing a story. And at first I thought that could be uh, sort of a big challenge, but it actually just forced us to, to, to simplify, and that's sort of like something we do with everything, you know, try to keep things, things as simple and iconic as possible. So we, we would stay away from complicated plots, and, and you know, it, it mostly became a show about characters and, yeah. you know, how the characters interact, and, and, you know, the punchline is always between the relationship, not necessarily what the plot is. And yeah. um, so, you know, that... that it was sort of a, a risky move. I mean, it, it's a risky move on every level because we have to design more characters. Yeah, more it creates characters. a lot more work than we normally would do on a, a, a superhero show. And uh, we weren't sure people were going to get the four men at first. We, we yeah. weren't sure people were going to be able to, you know, there was that question, are they going to understand that this teaser is not going to have anything to do with right. uh, with the rest of um, the episode? But uh, I think you know. we kind of 
sneak we kind of slowly got them used to it by the first the first three aren't totally detached from the main plot of the uh the rest of the show mm-hmm. you know our blue beetle teaser was green arrow and the batman and so when we come to the main part of the story blue beetle and his friend are watching what we just saw on tv so you know we did things to bridge it before we totally cut the teaser off from the rest of the show so it was a way to get people used to the idea but now, once we, I mean, I don't know exactly when we actually totally just started making the teaser stand alone, but we've been going, you know, ever since it's just been, you know, no looking back as far as doing that. So, and we try to mess with the format as much as possible, you know, whenever we can. But yeah, and it's a fun opportunity, you know, to take ideas that you can't devote um, to a whole episode and, and do it in the teaser, you know, if I've, yeah. uh, you know, like for instance, uh, we're doing a teaser based on like the rainbow Batman cover. Yes. Um, and you know, we can never have <laughs> that into a whole episode, sure. nor we would you have wanted to. Yeah, <laughs> but, that's a little too much. I understand. Right. So, but you know, just, uh, I think it's going to be fun just to see that cover, even, even oh, if yeah. the rest of the teaser sucks, but <laughs> <laughs> well, say that again. I didn't hear you. He said, uh, even oh. if the, re- well, it's, it'll be fun. It's fun to recreate those fifties moments. Which is kind of sort of what Grant Morrison was doing with the comics in a different way with the Batman comics. He was using that 50s and Silver Age stuff and twisting it. I think we're doing it a little bit more earnestly. You know, we're not really saying, you know, Batmite is a, a really a demon from another world or something. I don't know. I didn't read all of it. You know, uh, you know he's, he's, he's going to that well, too. But we're kind of redoing Like, for instance, we did do the, uh, we have a Batman, uh, the Batman of Zurinar episode is coming up. Awesome! Yeah, and it's really cool. I've just, you know, we just finished it, and it's it's really it's going to be something to see. Fun cast too. It's really fun. Are we uh, allowed to see who's in that cast? We weren't told not to. But anyway, well, we'll what? just say the Batman of Zurinar's and the, the actor who plays the Batman of Zurinar's initials are KC. Oh, fantastic! Hey, and and speaking of which, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I think we can all do the math and, and know who you're talking about, of course, the great Kevin Conroy, who yeah. was the voice of, of the animated Batman for so long. And I, I can understand, and, and, and I have to admit, I, I was kind of in that camp as well when I heard that not only on your series but the previous series that they were going to change and not use Kevin. Sure. I, I think a lot of fans... You know, there was obviously that whole fandom that, you know, it's got to be one way or no other way. But you can also appreciate, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And Kevin, to a generation, really was, until the Christopher Nolan movies, a definitive Batman. Oh, and, sure. And I think he, he, he will be, you know. He, oh, he and Adam West, I think, you know, he's kind of locked into that. And, and uh, I mean, part of that, I think, is just because he's done it so long. I mean, but not, you know, no taking away from the fact that he's just really good. He's he's a great actor doing it too, but um, yeah, you know, I just think for our show, even though we are using actors from we're we're, we're we are using actors who have an, a connection with Batman in different ways, like you know we used Adam West and Julie Newmar, and you know mm-hmm. we had Lauren Lester who was Robin on the Batman the Animated Series do a voice each Green Lantern. So oh, that's I mean, cool. I like using them in cameos, I just think for the way we needed our show to be and this Batman to be, there was a different quality that was kind of needed. Sure. I mean, Diedrich's great. I mean, he... he Absolutely. Comedic timing, which, you know, of course, if you say comedic timing in relationship with, to Batman, people <laughs> roll their eyes. But really, his even even though his deliveries are just deadpan, there's a, there's a comedic timing necessary to do that. And not to say Kevin couldn't do it, but it just and we needed a, a different quality um, to the voice. And I don't know if it's because Diedrich's a dad or he's just a generally, you know, friendly guy. Not saying Kevin isn't, but I'm just saying. <laughs> oh no, I understand. We wanted that there was a quality we needed for this Batman um, that was a little otherworldly. The thing I like about Kevin's Batman is it's very rooted in reality. He 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 doesn't overplay anything. He he catches the Shakespe- the Shakespearean elements of Batman. I mean, he's compared it to Hamlet, um, but we didn't need that for this. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was well, almost he was you know it just was it wasn't that Batman we were doing. So, well, but not only visually, but I think in its uh, actual tone, in story and dialogue as well, this Batman is akin to 
the Silver Age Batman. And, you know, in my conversation with Neil Adams, we talked about how, you know, the the character started in the 40s and was the the Dark Avenger and the Night Avenger. And then somewhere in the late fo- or early 40s to the 50s, he became the policeman's friend and a daytime character. And you yeah, are- I mean, that, that the, the Dark Batman wasn't that long. I mean, I right. and he wasn't even, I don't, from what I read, he wasn't a huge hit until he became more accessible and, and Robin joined him. And I mean, you know, he, yes. his solo years weren't that long. No. You know, I mean, the, the world at large knows Batman and Robin. Of course, now that's changed since the Burton movies and, and now with Nolan. But for the longest time, it was Batman and Robin. You bet. And there is a, you know, for there's a wealth of material out there where that's what you get. And there's a whole world of, and, you know, and not to, again, go back to defending Adam West Batman, but a lot of those episodes were direct translations of 50 stories. Certainly. Bill Finger wrote, so... You know, I mean, people want to disparage certain aspects of Batman's history and ignore them and think that that's not, you know, as valid as other aspects. And it's like, it's all Batman, you know. Well, you guys were very succinct, I think, in in giving Batman that wonderful speech. Right. In, in that episode that uh, I can even, you know, point it at some fans that I know that, that get very, you know, defensive about the Dark Avenger Batman. And that really is the only Batman. And and they're wrong. And and again, it's uh, that's what makes the character great, that it is flexible enough to fit all these different roles. And I think, again, Diedrich, you're, you're totally right. He's he is a father figure and he's a trainer. And you see that in the series. And it yeah, comes I mean, through he, in his he, characterization. He's the host into the world of DC, you know, and, and yes. correctly, DC, when we cast Diedrich, he knew immediately what his role in the show was. He told us, he said, my show, my role is just to be the host here. <laughs> so, you know, he, you know, because he's the one constant from, every week there's new people coming in to do voices, but Diedrich's the, the one continuous thing. There is no cast but him. And so he realizes his role is to make all the other actors feel comfortable being there, uh, you know, to set the tone for it. And the, it basically, he's the introduction, like Batman is, to this world of DC characters. So he has a, a, a more laid-back, um, less angst-ridden uh, attack on the role that I think works. And, you know, the thing about this show is, as far as the Batman history and stuff, there, I mean, I like to think of it. this show as the thing that crawled up and killed the bug that got up the ass of all the Batman fans. <laughs> Yeah, because it's like, okay, guys, yeah, there is the Dark Knight, there is Batman had a gun for, what, a year? (laughs) I mean, it's not like that is his whole history. And that's not who he would have, he wouldn't have survived if he had stayed that Batman for... Agreed. um, No one talks about the Shadow anymore. The Shadow isn't a prominent character, because he didn't change. (laughs) Uh, You know, I mean, it's like, they want to pick and choose what, what is real Batman and what's not. And it's like, okay, I've got... You know, 30 years of comics to say this Batman is that Batman, too. So No, I'm with you, man. And, uh, Michael, I, I feel bad because James is James and I have been, like, geeking out and, you know. Oh, yeah. No, no, James gets on his Batman so <laughs> far. I my, uh, I'm know, used to this. My Batman <laughs> high award, yeah. Well, no, but, Michael, I wanted to ask about one episode in particular, and that's uh, the Music Meister episode, because I, 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 at least on IMDb, you're credited with writing it. Is that correct? Well, it's ironic. We just talked about this. Yeah, but. you know, <laughs> I, I feel bad. I mean, it, it's it. Yeah, I, I wrote it, but I mean, and, and the honest truth of it is, like, I had the least amount to do with that. I mean, you have you Ben Jones who directed yeah. that, and all his board guys who had a. Who, I mean, it, it was hugely complicated just to board. And then, you know, the thing that sells that episode really is the music. And you know, James helped me out with a lot of the lyrics. And okay, because of all those lyrics. You know, there really isn't that much script to write because we basically wrote the first the songs first and then sort of uh, yeah. crafted the script around it more or less. And it was like literally the easiest uh, writing job I ever had. <laughs> so uh, and I think originally you were going to write all the songs, and I just one night I just woke up and I realized that we were, we were getting close to the deadline. I said, you know, we may need more than three songs, and I was like, I don't know if Michael can do all of those. And we needed more songs because we decided we were going to fill up a lot this episode. And I and I didn't even know if they were going to be any good or not. So I wrote a couple of songs, but it wasn't I wasn't supposed to. Yeah, he just showed up with with two songs, <laughs> and I was pissed because uh, the whole reason I wanted to do a musical was for for the royalties on the <laughs> right. 
any <laughs> any writer, if there's music in any episode of a TV show, it's the writer wants to do it to get royalties. Yeah. So, so no, uh, but yeah, I mean, more than anything, that episode was uh, was a group effort, and you know, we we put more money into that episode than other episodes. You know, we had yeah. a live orchestra play for it. So, I mean, everybody really, everyone stepped up. Yeah, and uh, you know, the reaction to it was was gratifying. So, well, and yeah. well, I'm glad you mentioned that it was a live orchestra as well because uh, learning more and more as I do about film and animation, I realize that a lot of times a composer is really at a synthesizer and what sounds like a full orchestra in a lot of times is really just the composer at a, at, at a synthesizer. And you don't yeah. realize when you have real instruments. Well, now, wait, you mentioned royalties and I want to know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I expect this thing to become uh, like, you know, a Buffy sing along. Eventually, and I certainly hope so because that's if if, if listeners have not seen that in, uh, episode in particular, God, the whole cast really outdid themselves. And uh, who's the actress who plays Black Canary? A uh, great Delisle. My yeah. God, she was wonderful. Yeah, she's and she was very nervous about doing that. In fact, she asked Deidre to leave the studio. <laughs> how she did it because she just was so nervous. She's a great singer, but she was just nervous singing in front of people. Yeah, and we also crafted a lot of the story around. The actors we knew who could sing too. Yeah, we had to figure out who who, who could who, sing who could and who sing. couldn't. And, then, and yeah. you know, uh, amazingly, like most of the actors we use have like these amazing voices. So, and Ph. Uh, Neil Patrick Harris. Oh yeah. Well, you know, he had done some. He's he's done voices in the past. He was in a, a Justice League episode. You know, he also was in that Spider Man animated right. Yeah. Uh, show. Right. Right. TV, yeah. But I swear, ever since seeing him in the Harold first Harold and Kumar, like <laughs> right. you know. I, I I've been a big fan of his. You know, I even watched Doogie back in the day. But <laughs> before Doctor Horrible came out, I, I wanted to put him in a superhero musical. And I remember reading an interview with him uh, on on Ain't It Cool, and he was talking about he was doing a he was going to play a supervillain uh, in a musical. And I was like, is he joking? Because like <laughs> that was the exact same idea that uh, you know I, I wanted to do. But you know, I think the fact that he had done that already, right. you know, I think helped. Our, our thing even more so you know there's a little bit of fear that we're going to be going over the same sort of uh, track but uh, I think it worked out nicely yeah I, I've seen him in a, um, a version of Sweeney Todd of all things and I had at that point had didn't know he sang either uh, so it was like it was good and, and we've been wanting to do a musical on various shows for a while now you know we you know if Legion had gotten a third season we probably would have had them doing a musical because a lot of that cast we're singers too. Very cool, man! I got to give it up to you guys for that Legion series as well, because, and and really, and and I I know again as as a guy in his forties that this stuff is not meant for me, but it was I I wasn't the biggest uh, Teen Titans Go fan, and the Legion was just such a wonderful. It, it just seemed like again, much like what you guys are doing now, it satisfied both the younger viewers that I knew who were watching it. And and again, as a guy who grew up on you know hardcore Legion of the sixties, seventies, and eighties, it was fantastic. It really was a great show, and I was disappointed that they didn't get a third series. So yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, well, we were on a, a sinking ship with that yeah. network. So <laughs> yeah, was, you know, yeah, I mean, that's true too. You're right, WB. I, you know, I mean, you know, I I say never, never say never. So maybe the Legion will come back in some form or fashion. But yeah, that that show was. So particularly when Michael came on as story editor the second season, we really pushed it, and, and it really went in places that I, I really wanted it to go. And I thought we were really developing, you know, something big that we were, we could have led up to in the third season, but alas. Well, and that dark uh, future version of uh, of Superman was fantastic. I mean, I didn't really want to do it first. In fact, I was no pitching, kidding. I was pitching Monel because I mean, sure whole, we love him. We love Monel absolutely. But and rightfully so, the the network said we you know they needed something they had they could sell as something really different. They and, wanted yeah they also yeah. wanted Superman to be edgier right and, uh, sure and in lieu of actually changing Superman's core character, we created this new character who was basically tied to him, and uh, you know I you know I, I thought he he turned out way better than I was expecting, <laughs> and I predict that in ten years. Some sixteen guy who's sixteen year old now who becomes a writer for DC will introduce that character into the DC universe. And, isn't, uh, isn't it interesting? And he won't get any credit for it. Well, and and I don't know because you guys are on the other side of Warner Brothers. It just seems like it's taken forever for the comic book side 
since the Batman Beyond series went off the air, to do anything more with Terry McGinnis. And right. I think that character became a very popular character and, yeah. really, you know, carved his own little niche. And the few times in the, in the 2000s that he's made appearances since the old Batman Beyond comic book that was tied to the series was canceled, everybody goes apeshit. They love it. Oh, yeah. Him. I mean, I think sometimes some shows find it takes time for, again, the six-year-olds who watched it, and didn't think it sucked like the twenty five year olds who are watching it at the same time. Yeah. Once those six year olds grow up and, and eventually become creators, they they go back to what they remember. It's the same as me going back to Adam West, you know, or uh, here, here. You know. So James, do you think uh, there's any sh- chance in like fifteen years that our Aquaman will be the comics version of Aquaman? <laughs> you know. Hey, well, you know what? It, he used to be the comics version of Aquaman. We we didn't reinvent the wheel on him, but you know. <laughs> That's the thing. I, the thing about this show is, 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 particularly with that Aquaman episode, is I remember when DC Comics changed for me was when Aquaman's son got killed. Yeah, that's when all of DC Comics changed and got darker. And was, that, I, was that during the crisis? I forget. No, it was before the crisis. Okay, it was. It was, it was a few years before the crisis. Okay. Um, but that's when I was as a kid thinking, "Wow, you know, harsh. This is harsh." Yeah. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, for me, DC Comics has a, it is an own literal own universe, and I kind of I, I, I miss when DC Comics didn't want to be Marvel. <laughs> Not to get in trouble here, but you know, I mean, where I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, stories at the most they had a two parter. Now it's you know, I mean, yeah, you got to do what the market demands, but I, I miss the simplicity that DC Comics used to have, and that's kind of what right now actually works better for TV. And so I'm like, well, if they're not going to do comics the way they used to do, I will let's do a show where the way comics used to be. So that's kind of where we're our whole standpoint is with this show. By the same token, though, and I want to give it up again to Michael because I see that you were the screenwriter for the Wonder Woman uh, DC animation DVD. Yeah, very, yeah, very good. <laughs> a completely different tone, but yeah, I had a lot of fun on uh, on that. James actually is a huge Wonder Woman fan, so. Uh, I think I, I just finished working on Legion at the time, so I would bug James constantly with my my Wonder Woman uh, questions. <laughs> well, Michael, I got to tell you, man, I, I there are very few current and modern writers that I think really know what to do with Wonder Woman because, unlike Batman, I think there's a real mishmash of a lot of crappy stories from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and even some of the 70s stories, but. Uh, I, I loved the tone that you took and really brought it back to her, not only the Amazonian roots, but also as a, as a Greek myself, I loved what seemed to be nods to the style of 300 that, that came through, at least to me as a viewer in the movie. And it was a, a Wonder Woman interpretation that I wasn't expecting. And I really had low expectations for the film and was totally blown away. And really it was, I think, along with Green Lantern, uh, those were the two best cartoons i think that dc animation did for the dvds in 2009 yeah uh, well, the polls seem to support your opinion yeah I, you know <laughs> and you're right she is she's a tough tough character and her fans are even more sort of possessive of I her bet. batman fans <laughs> but you possessive, know he means psycho no i don't <laughs> but uh, you know it's at that same james was mentioned it earlier like they don't want to see their heroes with any sort of weakness so Certainly. i mean even the fact that Wonder Woman doesn't fly in in this like caused also. <laughs> see, I mean, they want her to be better than than Superman, basically, yeah. or but Superman's equal. Yes, and it's a very small niche of uh, of fans, but you know, we're trying to make something sort of for mainstream. Yeah. But I always feel bad that you know sometimes the mainstream choices you make alienate like her core fans, and and it's a sort of a tricky balance. You don't want to alienate the mainstream, and you don't want to alienate the you know the people who love. You know the character so much, so I mean that's that's what I always find like tricky with with the job that I have. So and I always come at it sort of from the mainstream point of view because uh, you know I, I you know if, if anything I'm a Batman fan, so I, I, my my you know I have my own preferences for him, but uh, but yeah it's 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 crazy. Like comic book fans, I find are crazy, and it's a little. <laughs> Like to go for me to go on message boards for anything is always passionate. Like an, passionate. It's always an ex- exercise in, in self loathing. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about your Batman. We've heard about James's what you know the the portions of Batman that James has loved. What about what aspects of Batman have you loved through the years? You know, my brother was a big comic book guy, so I I sort of 
he would he would basically hand me his favorite Batman stuff, and that was during like the you know sort of when the Burton movie came out and that that you know uh, okay. killer stuff. So I mean, I sort of grew up like just when he was sort of turning into that that you know gritty sort of uh, character, constipated, sort of dominate. <laughs> The '90s, and and you know when I wor- I worked on the Batman before I worked on the you know Batman Brave yes. and Bold, and everybody on that that show sort of wanted to do that Batman, and they also they want they wanted to do they they wanted to top what you know James and everybody else did on Batman the animated series, and they they, they wanted to do something that was was sort of like uh, you know the uh, you know, adult and, and and edgy and all that stuff. So and 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 myself too, I you know I was story editor on season four of that show and. The good season. Uh, I was going to say the good. I, I, no offense, man, but yeah, it was the good season. Well, but I, I sort of the thing I like is I, <laughs> I, I got out all those sort of stories out of my system because anybody who comes to that Batman property nowadays, they want to tell those sort of. They want to have an opportunity to tell the edgy stories, and I think James and I have sort of got that sort of need out of our system, <laughs> and uh, so we were able to come to Brave and the Bold, like having, okay, we've already done that, that's out of our system, let's, let's do something, let's do the opposite, so... Yeah, let's uh, make Batman fun again. You know, but, but it, and it worked, I mean, like our development process was, you know, let us just do the opposite of everything people normally would, would do. Batman won't be in Gotham, we won't see Commissioner Gordon, uh, you know, he, he, he he's practically like superhuman. Yeah, and we don't see Bruce Wayne. And, yeah. And... You know, so so being able to sort of satisfy, like, you know, whatever sort of fanboy, you know, tendencies that I had on the Batman, I think, helped, you know, the Brave yeah. and Bold be, be a little bit uh, more fun. I so like, the, I like yeah. too, oh, excuse me, James, go ahead, go ahead. And, I'll, and I'll I'll get my point in a minute, but you go no, ahead. No, I was just, uh, you know, I, I didn't have anything more to say. <laughs> so, uh, well, we're just going to ramble on. Well, go, go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, what I was going to say is I... Um, I, I thought it was interesting that during the Batman series, by the way, awesome theme song, The Edge, nice going, holy shit, yeah. that you can't you can't go wrong there. But it was interesting that uh, efforts were made to some in some ways modernize some characters, like giving the Joker the dreadlocks and things like that. And you guys again went for this retro thing. Green Arrow is a perfect example. We see him in season four. He's the you know pointy bearded blonde like we see in the comics, Ollie. Whereas your guy's Green Arrow really does call back to the Jack Kirby and and really even before that the forties years, the clean shaven years of Green Arrow and stuff. Yeah. Well, I wanted to start, you know, the the show. I wanted it to be kind of in the the formative years. I don't even say formative years. When I started reading comics, well, actually, when I started, Green Arrow was the lefty guy, you know. But when I found out where he came from, you know, what he was for the twenty years before that, right? I was like, well, no one's done that in animation. I mean, my first time seeing him in animation was Super Friends, and he had the beard and yes. The, you know, the 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 seventies costume. And I'm like, well what haven't what hasn't been done? You know, what and I you know, and I've said something in print somewhere that I think of this show as the Earth Two version to Batman the animated series Earth One. Oh, I like that. So you know, it's like if you will believe in that you know, and fanboys love the multiple universe. You bet. <laughs> of us is the you know, we're in the you know, we're the Earth Two version, <laughs> you know. We're, you know, we're what Earth 2 used to be to, uh, you know, DC fans back in the 70s and 60s and 70s. By the by, the same token, though, I think you guys have provided characters like uh, the new Blue Beetle and also even Ry- the Ryan Choi Adam uh, a better platform than, uh, you know, the comics. I mean, and, and taking nothing away from the writers and artists of the comics who, who did try very hard and I think wrote very good stories, but the public just didn't accept them the way that they seem to have on, on the Brave and Bold series. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the general public just go- knows what the personalities are. They don't know anything about Ray Palmer or um, or Ted Cord. Sure, although well, you, you guys did the Ted Cord nod, though. Right, but we're able, you know, the, the other thing of, uh, uh, past shows I worked on was we we would avoid like the plague doing anything that would appeal to fanboys. Like the minute we we brought up something that would be something fanboys would in, would only only fanboys would get, it was immediately dismissed. And so with this, I'm like, well, why not cater them? You know the you know the average casual viewer, if they don't know what something is, we have Wikipedia now, even though. That's, <laughs> That's got lots of problems, but you know what I'm saying? If you, I think that it's okay to sh- introduce a character that fans may not know of, 
let him look it up, you know? I mean, it's not like... <laughs> It's not like the first Batman I ever saw. I knew everything about every character in it. Sure. Know? So I, I'm not afraid of the the, the fan wankery that some <laughs> use. Stuff. I mean, I embrace it. I think that's the only thing that gives this show that's different besides the humor is is the embracing of DC history and and trying to reconcile. I mean, you know, having two Blue Beetles in a show, having two Flashes. You know, what I mean, yeah, the things that. Before, people would have said, oh, that's too confusing. The average viewer won't get that at all. And, um, you know, I don't care. <laughs> we don't care on this show, so I'll catch up, you know. Absolutely. And, and also, and, and we've been, you know, leaning so hard on heroes, uh, the, the great old villains that we literally haven't seen since a lot of those 50s and 60s old-fashioned uh, comics and stuff. I mean, that's been a pleasure to see as well. Yeah, I mean... You know, this thing is I don't know what, what a real six-year-old is thinking about when they watch the show. <laughs> I mean, cause to me, that the, the older designs that we're using may seem old-fashioned, but I don't know if, if a six-year-old hasn't been exposed to this stuff, then pretty much anything you put in front of them is going to be bright and shiny new to them. So I, I don't worry about it. You know, and for some, the Batman, I, you, know, I, you know, there's a certain age group that will look at this Batman and go, ugh, I hate it. <laughs> A Batman was my Batman. Sure. And, uh, you know, that's okay. Absolutely. Know? Batman is that kind of character. He's he's flexible like that. He can he can take different, you know, in, in incarnations. And it, he's such, that's the, the, the beauty of his character. So. Well, now, you guys have kind of teased a little bit in terms of mentioning Haunted Tank and uh, the Zathur Batman and that. What, uh, what other things can you tease as this uh, second season starts to unfold the uh, different uh, people we might be seeing or uh, whatever hints you're willing to give us now tomorrow friday we are airing our gsa episode which uh, wow you know i think will be fun for a lot of old-time fans uh i don't know james you want to talk about the who's showing up um you know well i just want to preface by it's not going to be the whole jsa so <laughs> don't write us in <laughs> Oh, those guys, how could they leave out Sandman? And how could they... We They exist. We just, for the purpose of this story, we couldn't hire 20 actors. How many JSA uh, characters are in the story? Um, Let's see. There's Black Canary. There's Well, we reconcile the Black Canary issue, because there's this... Basically, we have the Golden Age and the Silver Age Black Canary in one show. Nice. And you'll see how it works out. Sure. When we uh, do it. But we have The Flash, we have Hawkman, we have um, um, Dr. Midnight. We have our man, and uh, am I missing someone? A wildcat, wildcat, of course. Outstanding. It's not so much about the Justice Society as it is. I mean, another thing that goes through this series, I think, is the idea of there's two things: the idea of legacy, the legacy of superheroes, mm -hmm. and the idea of family among superheroes. And with those are two big themes that come up in this show, this episode that airs tomorrow, and it's a it shows us how Batman kind of trained to be a hero, and the JSA is involved in that. And um, uh, it touches on the idea of legacy with, you know, heroes who have been there in in this universe before Batman showed up. So it's kind of trying to take the idea of Earth-1 and Earth-2 and blending them together a little sure. bit. Sure. Because, uh, you know, in my head I'm always trying to see, okay, what the timeline. I don't, I'm not a big continuity nut. But I, since I wanted to use these heroes who are going to be older than Batman, I had to, you know, we had to kind of explain how does that work. So, and in the story, you'll see that Batman was trained by certain JSA members. And well, and we saw that in the first season where you you kind of said that Wildcat was right. So know, yeah, so it's something we kind of have, have, have teased already. Yeah, you get a little more information now, and the the villain is um, Per Degaton. Awesome. <laughs> You know, it's got a lot of goodies in it, and we did a. I don't, you know, I don't want to spoil it, but we we have a newsreel. <laughs> you we spoiled it. Okay, well, I guess <laughs> um, it's really cool. I, I thought it turned out really well. And the teaser is. Uh, what is the teaser? The teaser is um, uh, a character dear to my heart, Detective Chimp. Ah, yes. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> and Detective Chimp will be showing up uh, multiple times uh, yeah. this season. He's Hilarious. Our, yeah, that's. So, uh, I mean, that's an example of me not. Uh, I go. There's a detective chimp. Sure. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
My pet is so ridiculous. <laughs> Let's put him in multiple episodes. But, you know, then the, the, the twist on it, it's like, okay, we'll take him completely serious. And not just take him serious, but he's going to be, like, the coolest character on, on screen. So yeah. he's like a Detective Chip m- meets yeah. James Bond. Yeah. Carmine, Carmine Infantino thanks you. Yeah, well, <laughs> The creator of Detective Chip, absolutely. Exactly, exactly. but, uh, yeah, so, again, that's a case where the, the main story is kind of really serious, but the teaser is fun. And, and, uh, yeah, it's silly. It's silly. It's silly, good silly, though. Not, I, I prefer to think of it as outrageous and audacious as opposed to just dumb, you know? <laughs> Don't do anything dumb. I mean, you know, uh, you know talking about villains... You know, I want to do I, the way I, I pick villains for for teasers sometimes or or little incidental is I'll go online and, and I'll, I'll do Google searches for the worst villains of all time. <laughs> to figure out how do we put them in there in a fun like n- not goofy or dumb way. So you know because of that you know Ten Eyed Man will will make an appearance. I love the Ten Eyed Man. I'm, I think I'm the only person that loves the Ten Eyed Man. <laughs> he was, well, I, I think when he appears on our show, you'll you'll find out differently that there's whole. <laughs> A whole cult of ten-eyed man yes. fans. That Yay! Come out of the woodwork. <laughs> but, uh. Hey, um, and and I know we're. I I had, I had told Winston we've only got forty-five minutes. Am I keeping you guys from dinner or anything like that? Are we okay? Yeah, we we're stuck here anyway. <laughs> oh, are you really? Oh, man. Are right, you guys alarming? Never. They don't let us out. They don't uh, let us, yeah. are, does DC? Um, you know, is is every character available to you guys that you want? I mean, is there anybody that says no, you can't use X character because they're in development for something else or or whatever? Uh, let me set the record straight because someone misquoted me as far as saying I didn't want to use or that we didn't want to use Superman or Wonder Woman. Yes, we desperately want to use them, but they're not available to us. Interesting. Okay. That's the record. We don't. We. It's not like I don't want to use them. The only thing I said was that in the real, the actual Brave and the Bold comic, Superman never appeared. And so I'm, I wasn't in a rush to have to use him. But, yeah, I'd love to use him, but they're not available to us at the time, at this time. Interesting. And hopefully that'll change. But, but you know, on, on the flip side, for every character we can't use, right. I mean, there's literally 20 characters we can use. Sure. Yeah, so, sure. yeah we're not hurting. I know. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, there's some people... It might make production easier if 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 we were limited a little bit more, but uh, yeah. you know, James James always like I always try to be sensible and say maybe we we could repeat this character, and James is like, no, let's 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 throw in you know I'll, I'll design five more new characters yeah, yeah. Us, that we haven't used before. So. Well, like we have this scene coming up in a show where it's basically the losers bar. Okay, and uh, it's basically every, it's not even C list Batman characters; it's C <laughs> list characters, and they all hang out at this bar. And there's like 20 of them in there, I guess. And, you know, they could have been just miscellaneous thugs that we've already designed. <laughs> but instead, uh, Ben Jones and I went through, I mean, not even, I mean, thank God they're for the Internet, because we probably wouldn't have been able to find out, find the, the, the as many obscure 50s Batman Z-list villains as we did to populate this bar. And uh, so anyway, that'll be coming up in an upcoming show. And, I mean, it's going to be a... a, a you know, people are going to really have to search to to find these characters, but every single one of them exists. I swear to God, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and they 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 create work for themselves on yeah. the show all the time like that. I mean, you know, there's that great scene um, where uh, Green Arrow and uh, Batman fight the the prison break. Um, yeah. they, they they they're capturing the villains, and the the script just calls for you know nondescript villains, and you know James of course has to design characters who. Uh, I mean, can we legally say who they're based on? Yeah, well, everyone knows. Everyone they're, knows. they're based on the old Adam West '60s show. It oh, was, sweet. Uh, yeah, so we did. You know, we. I mean, I kind of think of Batman as all one thing. So, you know, we may reference the '50s villains, but we also may reference reference the made-up '60s villains from the TV show. We may even reference the the filmation show from the '70s as far as villains. You know, you might see Sweet Tooth in the background or something. You know, cool. Uh, is there because the uh, Batman '60s show was produced by Fox Television? Is there a problem with trying to use some of those old characters uh, directly? It hasn't been lately. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Well, no, and you know, even in the comics, uh, uh, Nunzio De Filippis and Christina Weir did a wonderful King Tut story. But I yeah, guess I, I actually really liked that. I read that, and the art was amazing. You bet. You know, I think as long as we don't name them, you know, as long as they're cameos in the background, we're we're okay. If we okay. Give, 
you know, if we give them, like, lines and stuff, and, you know. Then it gets done. And I hope to God they resolve that, because that's, that's no shit. the greatest series that's not on DVD. And uh, they really, that's a shame that kids can't, don't have access to that show. You know, Remastered what? with full color and the way it looked when it first aired, because it's a great show. It's very inventive, and it opens up the world of, of comics to people. To uh, kids, and you know, it's a shame. They, they really need to to get that handled. We've got a great local affiliate in Chicago that actually does show uh, the old show in syndication and has the new prints of the of the episodes. You're cool. absolutely right, and also, God, that DVD of the movie. Looks oh yeah, the the remastered uh, Blu-ray one. Oh or? yeah, I mean it's it. I mean really, what a you know avalanche of beautiful colors and everything that just wash over you. It's crazy how beautiful that movie is. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of work to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> this is kind of what we each episode we go in, and we we you know there's no such thing as a stock background in our show. I mean, maybe the Batcave, but you know he's hardly in it in this show. So there's no you know there's not a lot of reuse of of materials that we create for each episode. None of them carry over to the next show, except Batman, you know, and maybe the Batmobile. So it's a, it's a real labor of love for all the people involved with the show to have to create all these new backgrounds and new characters and it's just a lot of work across the board and everyone you know that batman's the only character i think that really brings that out in people that just they give they bring their a game to it so you know big shout out to my entire crew and you know who helped make this show happen well here here as a viewer i mean it's uh, no the all you guys are really doing an exceptional job and and making a very entertaining series that uh I, I do look forward to and it's great that we're back in a cycle of new episodes how long is this cycle of new episodes going to last uh we did 26 well but i'm saying cuz i know oh. sometimes they break them up in terms of when they air that we well, well i know following the gsa one we we got uh, a sidekicks episode coming up so we're going to see um sort of like a teen titans episode i was yeah i was going to ask i saw the i saw an imdb a sidekicks assemble and it almost cried out to be a teen titans episode and i think it's 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 fun i mean uh you know you see a little bit of a rivalry between the adults and and the kids i mean and that's uh, <laughs> another one of our shows where the teaser is related to the to the main episode we've we've done that like once before okay and, now, uh, following that, what is following that, James? Uh, is it it's Firestorm? the first uh, uh, Starro Firestorm? one, I think. Uh, well, oh, that, we also have a, a Starro sort of um, arc that that's uh, going to be coming into uh, play a little bit more clearly. Um, I believe after that Sidekicks episode. Well, you saw the Challengers teaser, and that's yes. basically this. We're this season. We're structuring. We have a two-part, you know, mid-season finale. But leading up to that, we're going to have three teasers and you saw the first one with the challengers that reveals that starro is lurking in the background so we have two more teasers that will further that um storyline and then we'll have a big two-part huge story to kind of uh not kind of the, that'll be the story is the big starro invasion outstanding wow that's great and i that's, saw on imdb uh, one of my favorite teams will be making an appearance the metal men Oh yeah, oh yes. I believe Metalman is the one that's following uh, yeah. the um, the Sidekicks one, and and I think they they come off pretty charming in that episode. Yeah, I love the Metalman. I think that you know, I mean, and, and it's a pleasure to be the first show to really have to actually have them. If you don't count Mighty Orbots in the eighties, <laughs> but uh, you know, I mean, it's I they came off really well. I think they'll they'll be in they'll be the new fan favorites. I think this season. I mean, because the, the challenge with our show is because we're bringing. You know, so many new characters. Every episode is almost like a pilot for a new show. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so it's like you do a Metalman episode, and there's five characters that you have to come up with personalities for, and uh, you know they have to seem different and interesting, and, and that's that's tough doing it like on for for one show. And um, so you know we never know quite how these characters are going to turn out, but I think uh, in the case of the Metalman, uh, they all. You know, each one of them has a pretty good, distinct personality and, and comes off really well. I enjoyed watching the thread carry from last season what you guys did with the Outsiders and, and seeing them progress. And I thought, you know, there was a basis of possibly a spinoff. Yeah, and uh, in fact, we, you know, the next time you see them on this, as it, as we're, we're, uh, the whole idea was to, to lead them into being the Outsiders we know in the comics. And, uh,. Granted, I'm not sure if we did it exactly the best way, but I think I enjoyed the the times they appeared and yeah, and, um, you know, starting them out younger was an interesting choice that you know some people quibble with, but 
you know, by the end, you'll, they will be the outsiders that everyone in comics know and love. <laughs> but, you know, we show the journey. So I, I think it's a, it was a good choice, and I, I like the shows they've appeared in. Very cool. And i got to ask about Wildcat. Is that the guy from Full Metal Jacket, the sergeant? Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. <laughs> he's great. He's great. He, he loves doing it, and he's, he's really he, – in his Kubrick stories. So you got to love that. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. yeah great, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he comes in, and all the other the actors are, like, sitting at his feet almost, listening to him tell these stories about working with the Stanley Kubrick show. Absolutely. Hilarious. But, you know, he's a really cool guy. Yeah. Have now, been- I, you know, originally when his name came up, I thought, well, gee, that's not exactly who I hear as Wildcat, but thank God we did use him. I, I, lo- I think he... He nailed it. <laughs> and, yeah, James, I'm with you in terms of uh, that's not a voice that I would think of either, but he, he really did, and it was coming from a direction I didn't expect. It totally fits. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, and, and the way we're using Wildcat is being the Batman's mentor. And he's he's kind of Batman's surrogate father in this show. You know? Yes. He's the guy he went to and trained with when he decided to put on the costume. He had already been to Tibet and all that crap. But, you know, he needed someone to show him how to be a mystery man, you know. And so that's what Wildcat, and then we'll learn Friday, that the um, the Justice Society did for Batman. But Wildcat is the one he has the most personal relationship with. So, And, you know, he's, he's his surrogate dad. So, you know, we needed that fatherly, fig, you know, that fatherly touch that I think uh, Arlie Ermey brought to the character. And I think you fell into a kind of neat little synchronicity of uh, continuity because, uh, again, being the comic nerd that I am, Wildcat was inspired by the Golden Age Green Lantern, and that's why he put his costume on in the 40s. And also was in the same city, and that was Gotham City. Gotham, right. Yeah, that I knew. I knew that the original JSA stories were, I guess, in Gotham, right? That's right, even though it was, uh, I guess, the All-American comics versus National Comics when they were still two separate companies. Huh. Well, you know, I, it's all blo- it's all a blob <laughs> in my James. Yeah, because I and, know, you know, he know, you know. <laughs> and Michael will invite you to the next Dungeons & Dragons game, and you'll be able to play, too. I don't want Michael Tainted. He doesn't need to know anything about <laughs> um, It's too late, okay? Once I, I'm a denied man in Haunted Tanker, right, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm indoctrinated. <laughs> right, that, yeah, that's the nerd. Uh, your nerd membership is sealed there. Cool. More, more uh, war characters from DC, then? I mean, you mentioned the Haunted Tank. I, I can't help but think of the Losers and Sergeant Rock and some of the other great. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, it didn't turn. We didn't intend it that way. But I, I, yeah, there's at least one, at least one of those people is coming up, and cool. one that you probably could never get <laughs> that I will keep secret. It's a very cool <laughs> teaser, and yeah. the tone of it is, you know, yeah. Private Ryan and Cyborgs. So, <laughs> I mean, that's the great thing about this show. One week we're doing goofy Aquaman in a in an RV, RV. <laughs> and then the next week we're doing Batman's parents get killed. Yeah. So, well, I'm. Mean, but mostly, we, you know, because we have that sort of light, fun tone, we seem to be able to get away with, uh, you know, pushing the edges on the darker stuff. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a good question. Has, has anything been cut? Or, you know, ooh, don't forget this is a Y7 show. No, no problems well, with that? We are surprised. I, I think I, at least I'm continually surprised by what we get away with. I mean, yeah. every week it's like, well, they'll probably call this, but let's let's see what they say. And they, they're like, nope. I think a part of it, it's, they're like, well, this is a kid's show, you know, so they're not reading it with those necessarily. Well, I, I think the style of the show, and I think I, there's a problem. That's the only thing I find is that people look at this, uh, say they look at a still from the show, and they look at the design, and it's a little, it's more cartoony, for lack of a better word. And they immediately write it off as Kitty. And so they underestimate it when really, the sub- and subtextually, we have a lot of dark stuff in the show. And I think our kill count is pretty high. <laughs> it, it, it only goes <laughs> up going higher. Too. Right. We're going higher this season. Wow. So, but it's almost like people underestimate it based on how friendly it looks. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're showing the, you know, I think our, our Wayne... The Waynes walking into that dark alley is probably the bleakest image I think I've ever seen animated of a Batman's origin. <laughs> and we we actually gild the lily this season with the the Joe Chill show where we actually show it. So wow, yeah, and it's dark. I mean, I, in fact, we just I just finished editing it and it was dark. It was it's probably darker than I'm comfortable with, but I think that'll appeal to a certain segment of fans. But it's 
It's bleak. <laughs> yeah, we push things. I mean, you know, it may not feel like our show at the end of the day, but you know, one of our rules is that we don't necessarily have any rules. Right. So it's like, well, we'll try. We'll try just about anything, and just so the yeah. viewer is not like gonna know what's coming yeah, from week we, to week. Yeah. I mean, one week it'll be Aquaman's outrageous adventure, and the next week is going to be Chill of the Night or some dark, deadly serious kind of uh, episode. So. It sounds like Chill of the Night is going to maybe take a page from that old uh, 50s story when uh, when Batman kind of confronted Joe Chill. Well, actually, it's two stories. It's and uh, uh, it's the story where he finds out his bat his father wore a Batman costume once. Classic. And then it's the other story where he finds out that Joe Chill was actually a hired gun, and, uh, and that's something not hasn't been done in any form. I don't think live action or uh, animated. So uh, we, we we mushed those two stories together into one story, and it actually surprisingly works. <laughs> wow! You know, we uh, and I think they did something in the um, the untold legend of Batman in the John Byrne and um, or Jim Aparo and uh, I forget maybe Marty Pasco or somebody. I'm trying to think too. Yeah, I don't remember. It was a mini series from the the late '70s, early '80s. Mm-hmm. There was basically all those stories that led up to Batman's origin. Anyway, we went back to the original source material and combined those two stories into Chill of the Night. And uh, it's pretty, it's it's very, <laughs> so far it's carrying out to be the darkest, one of the darkest shows I've ever worked on. And I, you know, going back through Superman uh, dark side stories. Yes. And, you know, Batman Beyond and Justice League. I mean, it's still darker than any of that. <laughs> wow. It's bleak. So, well, that's uh, that's great. Well, that should satisfy again those those fans of that uh, era of uh, the Bruce Tim era and stuff. That you know, because those were great stories. And the man, the Dark Side story. What a great way to wrap up the Superman uh, series. Well, you know, originally that wasn't supposed to wrap up the the Superman. It was, it was no like, kidding. It was supposed to open it up to a whole new set of storylines, but we didn't get more episodes to capitalize on it. But. Uh, but yeah, so it ended up being for the best because you know, we kind of ended on that, and then we ended up using those threads in Justice League. So it uh, you know, it worked out for the best. But yeah, it wasn't intended to be that way. But this, we I just finished editing the Joe Chill one uh, last week, and hadn't worked with this type of Batman in so long that it was kind of depressing. So <laughs> I hope that's good for the fans because it's I'm like wow, I haven't worked on Batman Dark in a, so long that. It was like, wow, I'm I'm ready for the big bright blue Batman again. So, <laughs> so yeah, I'm glad I'm glad that's not our typical story, but it, I, I we wanted to do that story just to let people know we could do that story. <laughs> so, I, I warned James too. I go, Are you sure? Are you did. sure? Are you he sure? Did. He's he like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh wow. <laughs> he got we got it back. He's like, oh, that makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. Hey man, that's like when I was nine years old. I, that's when I read Jerry Conway's. Classic uh, Gwen Stacy dying Spider-Man story, and it didn't scar me. It blew my mind in a great way in terms of, you know, it really hit me in the drama sense that we were talking about earlier about the the Adam West series, that that's what, you know, the kids watching that show took from it was that it was high drama for them. Sure, yeah. And so, yeah, some kid whose first exposure to Batman is this show will get the origin of Batman, and, uh, and, you know, I mean... He'll he'll be old Batman the next week, but sure. for this one particular episode, he's going to be kind of serious and dark and scary because he, you know, he's finding out about the his parents' murder and stuff. But wow! But it's also done in a brave and the bold sort of way, as much as we can. I mean, you know, we use supernatural elements for it. You know, that's got okay. Or specters in it and Phantom Stranger. Oh, cool! So that's the one that you know <laughs> Kevin Conroy and um, Mark, Mark Hamill. Hamill are playing. Uh, yeah, Kevin Conroy's playing the the Phantom Stranger, and Mark Hamill's playing the Spectre. And uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, because so, it's kind of the whole the, the gist of the story. Not to go too deep into it, is that the Spectre and Phantom Stranger re- represent two halves of Batman. Like, you know, Spectre's all about vengeance, and I think uh, Phantom Stranger is kind of about understanding. He's 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 not out. He's a he's one of those. He's like the Watcher. He just wants to see what's going on and reconcile it and and make sure people bring good out of bad, you know. At least in our story he is. I don't know, you know, I don't know what he's doing lately in the comics, but you know, he's he's kind of the opposite of the Spectre. He's a supernatural character who's trying to find goodness in people. 
and the Spectre's trying to eradicate evil. And they, they use Bat- Batman's kind of their pawn, because he can go either way. And so, without going into detail, that's kind of what the gist of the story is. So that's where the brave and the bold element comes in, is that they're both otherworldly characters. Because without them, it would just be another episode of Batman the Animated Series. But Interesting. That's great, guys. Man, and you know, Dead Man was, was another wonderful first season episode, I thought, too. Yeah, yeah, it was fun using that kind of character and uh, figuring out a way where he made sense. And also bringing in uh, Gentleman Ghost. And, and Yes. You know, we were not very archy in this show, but we did like three Gentleman Ghost appearances that kind of told his story and True. how he could be. And I think in a pretty original way, so... It's fun to do that kind of thing with a character that no one really gives a shit about. <laughs> no, you're right. Honestly, guys, and, and I mean this, I, I give it up to you guys in the best way because it is. It is very entertaining, and clearly uh, I, I hope that even listeners of the interview will, will see uh, the love and respect you guys have for the characters and that if they ever had a preconceived notion and haven't watched this series, that they will tune in because – it's pretty obvious that you guys do love the material you're working with and are finding innovative ways to to bring it back, dust it off, and give it a new spin. So, really, nice going. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's that's the the whole goal of the show. And I, I mean, given the the general reception the show got when the it actually went on air, I I didn't think we had nearly as hard a time as I thought we would. So I know I thought it'd be yeah. at least a year before yeah. we uh, won anybody over, but. Uh, I don't know. I think we 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 did okay. I yeah. Think. Well, and yeah, I think people get that we don't we, we don't hate Batman or we don't have a you know we don't disrespect him. Yes. He's no. just it's just a broader take on the character, but it, it's basically the same guy as it's the same guy who was in the Nolan films, it's the same guy who was in the Burton films, it's the same guy who was on Beta. It's just a different shading. You know, going back to basics with him. Well, it's the characters in good hands, and and the series is is excellent on uh, on Cartoon Network, and uh, the new episodes always air on Fridays. We get repeat episodes on Saturdays, and I know also it runs sometimes in the morning, depending on the schedule. Yeah, uh, all over the place. <laughs> yeah, but that's no, that's no great. Uh-huh. Cool. And and you know, keep it up, man. I, I are you? Uh, I mean, I'm sure this is a full time responsibility. Uh, are you guys going to be doing any more with uh, some of the directed uh, DVD? Uh, Department. Well, I know Michael's doing other projects with them, but I don't know if he can talk about them. But. Yes, I, I may or may not be involved, uh, <laughs> but uh, nothing, nothing major, I will say. But on on a smaller scale, I have some stuff that's coming in the pipeline. Hopefully, for for that uh, the direct to, vi- to, to video stuff. Excellent. And I and and by the way, I don't want to. Uh, shit on uh, Public Enemies, if either of you or even my friend Jeff Loeb, who wrote the original story, I thought that was an excellent direct-to-DVD animated uh, film as well. I, I honestly think uh, where some of the misfires of films like Catwoman and, and, and some of those misfires that we had earlier in the decade, as far as the movies go, uh, DC's animated division has really been firing on all cylinders, and even someone who, as myself who wasn't a big fan of Teen Titans Go, I certainly appreciated and, and was pleased to see the amount of love that the fans had for the show, and there's a reason why that thing lasted for six seasons. Yeah, so. no, I mean, I think now is it's a great time to be a DC fan. I mean, if you want a lighter take on the characters, you got us. If you want a, a you know a PG, uh, thirteen take, you've got the DVDs. The movies are finally getting some initiative to to be cohesive and yeah. try to put something out regularly that's good. Uh, you know, I, I you know, I think there's a lot of good work coming out of Warner Brothers now uh, in regards to the DC uh, line, and the comics haven't been better. So it's it's a good time for fans, I think. And, uh, of course, fans being fans, it's never enough, but that's okay. <laughs> sure. That's okay. I'm glad they want more. Did this did this change, and I don't know if, how much you guys are aware of this, but, you know, near the end of the year there was an announcement that on the comic side it sounds like there is kind of a reformation and a, a more of an alignment with Warner's proper rather than uh, DC Comics kind of being the intellectual property laboratory that it was prior to that. Um, I don't know if that affects how you guys do business at all or not. Um, you know, we we kind of were underway while and or before that stuff kind of happened. So sure. Should we get a third season? 
we'll probably see the effects of that, if, if any. Yeah, I think the dust is still sort of settling on, on that, and everyone's still trying to figure out what the rules are going to be and how, how business is going to be done in this sort of uh, new regime. But, uh, but yeah, so far we, we've been, yeah, we, you know, le- left our own devices. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, again, it's nice because people tend to leave us alone. There's bigger fish to fry. Sure. The Batman movie franchise, and when you got that going on, we're kind of, under the radar a little bit. It's good. You know, I mean, we only exist to keep him out in the public until the next movie comes along. Sell toys. Which is, and sell toys, which is fine. I'm happy with that. That's great. You know, and Will that dictate the life of, of the cartoon? If, you know, I mean, in the same, I guess, sort of way that uh, the Chris Nolan films put an end to the Bruce Timm era? Uh, well, you know, that's not true. The, that, that's okay. True. Okay. No, good. I, I appreciate it's, it's the clarification. Popular knowledge, or, or it's popular, you know. It's I see myth. what you're saying. Okay. You know, uh, you know, we were doing Just League at the same time the Batman was getting underway. It's just, you know, nothing, nothing about the movie prevented us from doing Batman. The only thing it prevented us was using certain characters like the Joker and stuff, which helped us in Justice League because I think the things people liked about Just League were things we had to push to... We had to use other new characters on that because we couldn't use Joker and Penguin, which, you know, on Justice League, why would you need to use them anyway? But anyway... Agreed, yes. That's, that's, uh, you know, I'm going off tracks there, but... um, No, I appreciate the clarification because, yeah... There's a lot of misconceptions about why certain things didn't happen. You know, like the whole thing with Legion supposed to being a, a, a spinoff from Justice League... You know that Supergirl was originally going to be in Legion. That was never, uh, never uh, going to happen. I never heard that. That's interesting. I never heard that. Uh, well, well, you know, of course, Michael and I are addicted to these message boards. Sure. <laughs> but no, I understand, man. You know, there's like just a you know just a cesspool of misinformation. But uh, do you but know? I love them. Do you have uh, any yeah. inside information in terms of? Or, and, and really, I don't want anyone telling stories out of school. But yeah, in, in know, terms, it, it, in terms of the uh, the Justice League cartoon, which seemed to be such a, mo- a monumental hit within yeah. the fandom, and and that, yes, it maybe wasn't appealing to the amount of seven-year-olds, but I know that there were a bunch of 30- and 40-year-old fans that, you know, really, it, it, I, the amount of married friends of mine that had to explain to their wives why they had to watch this half-hour show, it would crack me up, and, and really, and the wives would just shake their heads and like, no, you don't understand. These guys are really taking it to levels of, you know, drama that, you know, again, growing up on the Super Friends, these guys had never seen before. Yeah, well, you know, going into that, we knew we just wanted to do West Wing with capes. And that's yeah. our motto. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, the thing with that and with any show is that with cartoons, 52 is the magic number. If you do anything beyond 52, it's a, it's a gift. It's not, you know, it's not like regular TV shows like Friends or something that goes on for yeah, eight years or whatever. Sure. Cartoons have a limited shelf life because, frankly, kids watch reruns like they're new. I understand. Well, and you and it's that is it that mindset of, you know, those seven year olds once they're you know nine year olds, it's time to like you said, just show the reruns to the new seven year olds. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, when we were kids, how many pop how, we watched the same Popeye cartoon <laughs> fifty times a month? <laughs> you know, You're like, right. You know, I mean, and basically, cartoons exist in America at least for kids. True. Not counting the stuff on at, at night for Adult Swim and Fox and all that stuff, but, or the Flintstones before it back in the sixties too. You know, if our if our shows appeal to fans, it's because we want it uh, appeals to adults. That's just because we chose to to do that, and the network didn't bother noticing. <laughs> it's, never, it's not like someone said, oh make a make a superhero show that appeals to adults and you know is is very well written and deep and dark and explores all these no one asked us to do that <laughs> you know no one will ever come to you and ask you to make that kind of show so you know we just did it because we wanted to but <laughs> and no one said not to but you know well but, you know just it was a great run and uh you know i mean we got the, the thing is now the dvds are kind of taking over what that show used to the niche that show absolutely did. so you know no, and I, and I know that did make a lot of fans very happy that that development came out of it. And we, as you say, yes, we've gotten some wonderful projects, and I'm glad, Michael, that you're you know able to work on those. And like I said, it's clear 
uh, from the Wonder Woman movie, for example, that, you know, you've got the right sensibility. And uh, when those things do come to light, I know that everyone is very careful of what they announce and when they can talk about stuff. In fact, uh, Kerry Russell and uh, uh, Nathan Fillion uh, were on a panel. Uh, I was on a panel with Nathan Fillion in Orlando. And he's just like, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm doing the Wonder Woman cartoon. And this was like, you know, two years before. I, I think Greg Nowak was really wanting to make that pop public, and he like his eyes got wide. He's like, "Who told you this?" I'm like, "Well, Nathan Fillon." <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think Michael has has gotten nearly enough credit as being a part of this whole DC animated universe. You know, Alan gets the credit, and Paul gets the credit, and rightfully so. Michael is right up there with those guys. You That's know? cool. He's kind of uh, he's not a, and not to say those guys are self promoters, but everyone knows those guys. <laughs> And Michael kind of, he's a little soft-spoken, but if you like Batman's, uh, the Batman Season 4, it's because of Michael. If you like Season 2 of Legion of Super, Superheroes, it's because of Michael. If you like most of Batman Brave and the Bold, it's because Michael is, you know, there. None of it was James. Is all <laughs> well, you know, I'm the geek factor, but, you no. know, yeah. It, yeah. That's very nice of James to say, but at the end of the day, I work in animation, and 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 <laughs> you know, I always say it's it's not a writer's medium, and so you know, I'm here. He's the only writer I'm, who knows that. I'm here to serve <laughs> the artist. So that that's sort of what you see. You'll I mean, never hear another writer say that. <laughs> it, it's true. It's true. I mean, that's why I like Bruce and and, and James, and you know, and I, I think it, the su- successful writers in animation sort of are able to um, you know bring sort of a point of view. But at the end of the day, what you see are the drawings, and you hear the voices and so i don't know i, I feel fortunate to uh to, to to take credit for other people's work so. well, but michael i will say respectfully and again growing up for you know the decades that i have watching animation and watching simplified dialogue it's really nice that in the same way that comic books have been allowed to grow up that animation in america has been allowed to grow up as well and that you know an adult can watch uh, uh, you know, I, I, again, Public Enemies, perfect example. I watched that with a guy in his 50s, and he was like, I can't believe how sophisticated this story is compared to the cartoons we grew up with. And it, and it, again, it's a credit to, I think, you guys and also the powers that being allowing you guys to, to tell smarter stories with smarter characterization and smarter dialogue. Well, the whole world's changed. Now every, everyone thinks they're a nerd. You know, everyone <laughs> kind of taken over the whole public, the popular culture, you know, and uh, it's cool to be a nerd. And everyone is raised, I don't know, if raised or lowered their level to nerddom. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, they can, I don't think you could have done that kind of show. The things we're doing now, no one would have, A, no one would have paid for them to be made back in the 70s or 60s or even 80s. I mean, if you remember the whole furor over over Tim Burton's Batman, nobody thought you could do Batman seriously at, before that. You know, it was always a struggle. You know, and it was the hardest movie to sell until they finally did, and and he he made it, and it it made a gajillion bucks, and then yeah. now it set the tone for everything that came after, for good or ill. You know, true. But uh, you know, people are accepting of different ways of doing superheroes. And you know that superheroes are kind of our American myth. You know, no those, question. That's America's mythological characters. You know, that's our history. You know, up there in capes and, and tights and stuff. You know, our con- contribution to, to culture. You know, that and jazz and other stuff. But you know, what I'm saying is like I do. You know, that's a uniquely American, you know, art form ideal that you know. So, you know, it's, it's great that we were able to do it now, and people take it fairly seriously. I mean, again, they took it too seriously to a point where no one could accept a lighter take on it. <laughs> and so, you know. But I think now, thank God for the Nolan movie. Thank God that there was enough of the serious, dark takes on heroes so that this would feel, fr- you know, fresh. I think if we had tried to do this kind of show immediately after the Adam West show, it would have, well, they did. It was called, you know... The New Adventures of Batman. Yes, I remember it well. (laughs) You know, but, you know, I think we're doing a little better than that. um, Definitely. (laughs) No, and I think you're right, and I think we're reaching a balance where uh, the hardcore older fans are becoming more accepting of the lighter fare that they used to dismiss, 
and and again it it re it, it it re-energizes this young base and gives them a palatable version of the character that they can grow up on much as we grew up um, james on the uh, reprints of, yeah, of those it, golden age and silver age stories well was, uh, you know again to use another quote i've used often is that I, this show is kind of like those hundred page spectaculars where you had a new batman story at the beginning and then the rest was reprints from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. You got it. That was my introduction to Batman. So all that Batman in the different eras is all one Batman in my head. So that's kind of what we do on this show is just use every different version and meld them into this one guy. And, uh, you know, I didn't think there was any difference between any of those Batman. So that's what we're doing on the show. Well, and you're succeeding. And, and guys, honestly, thank you so much for because I see now that we've been talking for uh, almost uh, an hour and twenty minutes. And oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. And I and honestly, I know it's dinner hour, uh, your time. So I'll let you guys go. <laughs> okay. Go eat. Go do something. But no, seriously, thank you so much. You guys are always welcome back. It was a it was a really great conversation. I like looking behind the scenes on on shows like this, and I, I that's what I hope to do with this show is give people a better perspective of what goes into a program like this and uh, beyond the 22 minutes we get to see every week. So uh, thank you for, for pulling the curtain back and, uh, and, and really telling us how it's done and uh, continued success. I look forward to the episodes coming up. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your support. Okay, now before we wrap up, uh, there's plenty of word balloon left because uh, this is from... A uh, Paley Center red carpet celebration of Brave and Bold. It was also to promote Justice League War at the time. So uh, James Tucker was there, Andrea Romano, uh, Diedrich Bader, of course, Batman, and John DiMaggio. And like I said, I I just uh, presented the red carpet portion with Andrea a couple weeks ago. So rather than have you sit through that again, even as great as it was, I wanted to give you the other uh, interviews as we celebrate Brave and Bold. And uh, at this point, they were looking back on how great the Brave and Bold was, and what a great experience it was. So uh, great to hear again from James Tucker, John DiMaggio, and wrapping up with Diedrich Bader talking Brave and Bold on a little bit more of Word Balloon. Thrilled to finally see James Tucker face to face. Absolutely, hey man, no, it's a pleasure and uh, congratulations. This has to be like a victory lap for you. Uh, ye, well, in terms of Brave and Bold. Though. Oh sure, uh, yeah, you're right. Actually, yeah, no, I mean, Brave and the Bold is a show that, of all the shows I've done, is probably nearest and dearest to my heart because I really put all of myself into it and it really was. I was able to tap into things from my childhood that I enjoyed, from my um, emergence as a comic book fan. From my coming of age in the Bronze Era of comic books, uh, the Bronze Age of comics, I, uh, you know, there was stuff from that era that I never really saw get adapted in our shows that I worked with prior to Brave and the Bold that I always wanted to, you know, I was always like, well, can't we do this or can't we do that or, you know, what about Signal Man and what about, you know, I mean... Uh, Ten-Eyed Man, you know what I mean? And these were topics and ideas that always cropped up over the years on the shows I was working on with uh, Bruce and uh, Glenn Marikami. And, uh, but it was always ruled out because they tonally didn't fit with the kind of shows we were doing. And I always knew if I ever got a chance to do my own show, I'd want to be able to pull all that stuff in. And so I finally got a chance to do with Brave and the Bold, and I've got it all out of my system. Unless they asked me to do more, and then I would love to. But... Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, no, this is this is really great. I, I never imagined I'd be doing a Paley uh, Center thing for Brave and the Bold. That's excellent, man. Well, the show deserves the attention. Yeah. Uh, I do want to tell because we, we spent so much time talking about the Brave and Bold in our first conversation. Right. I want to direct people to that. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the here and now. Justice League War, uh, Flash uh, Point Paradox oh, yeah. was excellent. And I don't know if we spoke okay. after it was finished, but oh, yeah. but uh, regardless. Um, yeah, tell me about the last two, uh, Flash, um, Flash Point Paradox and Justice League War. Yeah, Flash Point Paradox... Um, kind of got it was my next movie after doing um, uh, Superman Unbound right. Superman Unbound was kind of I think the last of the traditional ad- adaptations we were doing um, and uh, Flashpoint was this story that at first we just didn't know how we were going to really pull it off and then uh, we really reread the book really dove into it and pulled out what we thought were the things that really resonated or would resonate with fans and we knew we had to make sure Flash was the core of the the heart of the story and um you know it it came together uh at its heart it's really a solid story and um 
I, I think the movie turned out great. I mean, I wanted a movie to, that really kind of pulled people by the lapels because I think people had kind of gotten used to the way we were doing things. And there was a certain places we wouldn't go, little areas we wouldn't do go as as far as visual intensity and violence and and you know even sexual themes. Sure. That I, the story kind of lent itself to that, and there, I don't think there would it would have been as good. And I don't think anyone would have cared if we had kind of held back on that stuff because it's all inherent in the story. So it really really feels like a truly adult uh, DC movie. Right? And what, what about war? What, how much can you tell us about Justice League War? Uh, I can, well, I can tell you, uh, war is a very different kind of movie. And the other thing I want to do about, I want to achieve with this new direction is, I want each movie to feel like a totally different kind of movie. So some will have more comedy. War has more humor in it. Okay. But it also has a, you know, it's more over the top action. I think uh, a Flashpoint was very gritty, and the, the violence was kind of as grounded as you can be in a superhero movie. This is kind of um, sci-fi, big genre stuff. Um, it has, you know, a, a good core story with Cyborg and his dad that I don't think we've ever Terrific. explored before. So we always try to do, I mean, when I was going with uh, into uh, Brave and the Bold, me and Michael Jones, the story editor, decided that, you know, each show had to have hard humor, heroism. And I apply that to every movie I do. In different, in, in different proportions, of course. And so I think uh, Justice League War has a lot of heart <laughs> and a lot of humor and definitely a lot of heroism. And uh, Jay will even direct it, so you know the action's going to be kick-ass. Excellent, man. Hey, and uh, since we spoke, I saw Scooby-Doo, uh, oh, Mask of the uh, Blue yeah. Falcon. It was okay. excellent. Oh, okay. And just yeah. keep up the great work, man, oh, seriously. You. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get you on the phone and we'll get you definitely. for a long I'd run. Love to. But congratulations on tonight. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, John. John DiMaggio, great to see you. Uh, not only the wonderful bender for so long on Futurama, but the king of the sea, of course, Aquaman. It's a pleasure, sir. Outrageous, yes. I'm the king of Atlantis, yes. <laughs> a lot of fun, man. I was just asking Andrea the evolution of that voice and that characterization. Tell me about it. You know, Andrea was so key in, in you know, because it's funny, like, it was up to, it was up to me and... and and Diedrich for, for Batman. He got it. Wow. Which is great because I love Diedrich. And, you know, he was a, he's a friend of mine before the show. Cool. And and then she said, well, you didn't get Batman. I said, oh, that's cool. You know, it's the breaks. She said, but you did get Aquaman. And I was like, yeah, Aquaman, <laughs> awesome. I'm going to summon whales. This oh, is going to be awesome. And so, you know, just being able to just play. I mean, come in and play. Andrea and James, I mean, everybody... Everybody on the show was just fantastic, and and getting to sing the songs that we did, and just do all this stuff, and you know, and getting to play, you know, being, being, you know, uh, you know, uh, Aquaman and Gorilla Grodd, like getting to play both, you know, both sides of the, you know, of the of the of the crime spectrum, you know. <laughs> It was just that was just that was just a lot of fun to be able to do that on the show. Well, and I, w- I want to ask about another villain that you've played, but first I got to know for an Easter egg, what would your Batman have sounded like? You know what? Oh no! I think he would have sounded something like this. Yeah, that's pretty much what I would have done. <laughs> He's got that natural sort of thing that happens. It's- it's perfect. His his Batman would have been. It, it, it is better than my Batman. That's why he's. That's why he's freaking Batman for crying out loud. Yeah, but man, I'll tell you, you had a tough challenge in Under the Red Hood, and I got to tell you, your Joker and I, everyone loves Mark Hamill, and it's a signature role. But your Joker was incredibly effective, not only for that movie. I hope you get the chance again, because really, man, that was the sizzle in that movie. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, two things that are very similar, or in fact, totally similar, similar about. Batman Brave and the Bold and Under the Red Hood is that Andrea directed both of them. So I was fortunate enough to have her say, John, um, I need you for this uh, project. I said, sure, anything for you. She said, you're going to be the Joker. And I went, (laughs) and so I got to play and, you know, I mean, and the first recording was was the opening scene and you've seen it and it's brutal. Amen. Yeah. And so, I mean, we, we got off on that. You know, first thing. So, just you know, just be, just that was pretty pretty impressive, and and, and and I loved doing that. And it was a real dramatic turn as far as voiceover is concerned. You know, and like, and, and and that's always a wonderful challenge, and I welcome it all the time. I'm 
I'm totally game for anything, and that's the that's the beauty of doing what I do is that you know you get to play, you get to really play, and and you know I got to as evil as my Joker is, it, there's there's a sense of play in it, you know, you know you play you play out that vein. And, and and thank you. I appreciate it. That's no no question, man. Well, that's the thing. And like you say, it really is 180 from Aquaman and certainly Bender and stuff. And while while I mentioned Bender, you know, Futurama wrapping up, yeah. I, uh, I'm i one of those people, as I'm sure millions of others, that hope that it does find another platform. Well, but if not... What's beautiful is, is that that last episode was an open door still. So in, in case anybody wants it, you know, that's the story. <laughs> but, um, I mean... 154 episodes, not too shabby, you know? Absolutely. So, I, I mean, and I had two people come up to me today and say, congratulations on Futurama. And that's the way I like to think about it. I don't think about, oh, man, it's a bummer about Futurama. It's like, no, dude, we came back from life. We came back from death twice. Like, we were resurrected twice to come back. And, and it was a joy, you know? And, 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 you know, big up to Adult Swim and big big up to Comedy Central, you know? I mean, just huge, huge um, support from them. And that's, you know, when you have that, hey, man, that's that's all right, you know? And we have uh, we still have fans, and, if, and, and we have the Simpsons Futurama crossover. We already recorded it. It's really, really, really funny. Is it scheduled? Is it? You know? Oh yeah, it's, oh, okay. no, we already recorded it, so it's, so. it's going to be on next season, I think. Okay, cool. So, but yeah, I mean, it's great, I'm, and, and and so you know, life goes on. Other things are happening. You know, I, I got I got uh, Adventure Time. I got you know, yeah, Ben yeah. Ten is still you know still absolutely Ben Ten. Uh, ninth, uh, um, um, Randy Cunningham, ninth grade, ninth grade ninja. I mean, just all sorts of stuff, and I'm just very fortunate, very blessed that I, that, I, that I'm in the industry that I'm in, and I'm able to continue to work and. And, you know, just keep going, see what happens. The talent proves out, man. No, you're consistently great. We always look forward to your next episodes and next uh, feature-length uh, directed video or on the big screen. So, Well, look out for I Know That Voice because that's the documentary. Oh, yeah, yeah. I uh, yeah, I heard about that and, in San Diego. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Did you Absolutely. make that? Jeff? Oh, yeah, I was the executive producer. Oh, that's that. great, John. That's, okay. That's my money. <laughs> hey, man, that's awesome, man, yeah. And uh, actually, uh, I have a panel tomorrow night at, uh, at, at Comic-Con, and, um, and we have a premiere uh, at the Egyptian Theater on November 6th. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, and we we have our PR team working on getting some press there and stuff like that. So, I mean, we're just... We're just chugging along. We're going to be on. Uh, we're going to be on in demand the first three weeks of December, and uh, yeah, big deal. I'm really excited. So. Oh man! Well, um, maybe I'm going to have to hit you up as soon as I finish this recording, and we'll, we'll get some uh, pub for that. On the, yeah, it'd be great, man. So, but no, pleasure meeting you, man. Continued success and uh, nice you. going. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Happy to see Diedrich Bader, of course, uh, everybody's favorite Batman from uh, Brave and Bold. Congratulations, man. This has got to be a cool Bailey Center thing. How many of these have you done? Um, this is the first Bailey Center thing that we've done for Batman, so it's a cool opportunity for me. I can't wait to see it, actually, and I don't know if there's going to be... I mean, uh, where are we watching it? Is there a crowd at all? Or? Yeah, they're, they're running the cartoon so you can talk, but we're going to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Uh, no, I look forward to it. <laughs> sure, and uh, since there have been so many distinctive takes on Batman... Yeah. Uh, I, I guess my question for you would be: Who is the kid who uh, is whose favorite is yours? Who is the kid whose favorite is yours? Yeah. Uh, who loves your Batman? Who loves my Batman? Above all the other Batman. Um, you know, I think that uh, it was interesting because you know I talked to Kevin Smith, and um, this Batman is one of his favorite Batman um, because uh, I think because it, it was made with real love, and we didn't exploit Batman. We never pushed him in a direction where. He couldn't go, but we did take him into a different direction. And, you know, we really reached into the lexicon of the superheroes, but also the supervillains. I mean, you know, Ten, uh, ten Eyes and, and uh, <laughs> Zebra Man. And, Absolutely. And, you know, crazy like, Quilt. Crazy Quilts. And uh, it was all cool. I mean, for my son, you know, um, he's such a comic book fan. Um, he bought the encyclopedia for DC long before I was Batman and that memorized the whole thing. So for him, it was really intense, you know, to, one, for his dad to be Batman, but also to see all of these characters that he knew and loved and were underutilized, because, you know, it's generally the rogues' gallery. And, you know, there's a limit to that. Tell me about playing the character on two levels, you know, the much like Adam West, you know, action for the kids, but humor for us older fans. Yeah, I mean, you know, what's interesting is the dichotomy between um, the sense of humor that ran throughout it and... Um, uh, 
and the, the darkness that really is the dark night. Um, because of the lighter tone, I had some jokes, but I kind of undersold them. I, I mean, the whole thrust of it, especially once we really got into the rhythm of it, was uh, Michael Jelnick wrote to this very well. The, uh, he's sort of I- ironic sense of humor. He's always commenting. And, uh, you know, because he is such an elegant person, um, it's interesting to him the characters that come into his life. Um, it was frustrating as somebody who's done so many broad comedies not to be able to really go out there. Dial it down? Yeah, to have to dial it down when, yeah, when, um, you know, like John DiMaggio could have such a good time. And I would see him going, you know, like totally over the top, being fantastic, but, you know, really going for it, and I just had to undercut everything. But, uh, you know, so it was an interesting... It, I love the whole process. Can you talk a little bit about how you and John played off each other? Well, John has this whole, I mean, the energy of Aquaman is just unbelievable. And, uh, and I, you know, always felt like Batman really genuinely appreciated him and his sense of humor. And, uh, uh, it was always fun to be there with John. John is a great, larger than life character. And, and uh, he always makes a voiceover session fun. I, I know every time I work with John, it's going to be a good time. Did, uh, did you ever read a lot of Batman? Because your characterization, I'm sure a lot of this is through Michael and James has that 70s, 80s kind of benevolent, friendly Batman that is friends to the, of all the superheroes, and not the loner that he's become, certainly in the comics and the yeah. movies. You know, it's different because the Batman that I really fell in love with was Adam West, and then it took a very different and dark direction. And I didn't really go with it. Um, I wasn't the biggest fan in the world of that. Um, I preferred Adam's. It was more fun. And uh, so that this show took that tone, I really appreciate it. Excellent. Hey, man, Thanks. congratulations. Thank you. Keep it up. Thanks, I appreciate that. Good seeing you, man. Nice to see you, too. Thank you. Okay, wrapping up, I hope you enjoyed uh, the conversations today about Batman Brave and Bold. Fantastic series. Jeez, if you've never watched it, you owe it to yourself to enjoy it. And especially if you're enjoying uh, the Harley Quinn animated series, uh, as I am. Man, two episodes in, it's very, very funny. You maybe heard our uh, interview with Patrick Schumacher just a couple days ago. Check it out and check out the series. It's good stuff. And uh, if you haven't watched Batman Brave and Bold for whatever reasons, good lord, what, what are you waiting for? My god. Check out the DVDs. Check it out streaming-wise. You won't regret it. It's a, it's a great, lighthearted uh, way to enjoy Batman. Uh, you know, kind of like the Batman Adventure comic books, of course. So uh, really appreciated the conversations with Mike Jelenic, James Tucker, Dietrich Bader, uh, and, of course, uh, John uh, DiMaggio on today's Word Balloon. All brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners via Patreon. If you want to subscribe to Word Balloon, go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon, and that'll take you directly to my Patreon page. Or click on the front page uh, ad for Patreon on at WordBalloon.com, and it'll take you there as well. But thank you greatly for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Uh, thank you, Aftershock, for your uh, over a year support here at Word Balloon. Greatly appreciated. Uh, I am proud to be associated with a great uh, comic book publisher that puts out really interesting stories. Uh, really funny, smart stuff. And great genre-bending ideas, man. Great action, great horror. Uh, great science fiction, The Last Space Race, one of my favorite Aftershock books. Uh, there's also great things from, uh, you know, Marguerite Bennett's Animosity and Baby uh, Teeth with uh, Donny Cates. And also, of course, jeez, uh, uh, You Are Obsolete, Matthew Clickstein. That book is terrific, I'm telling you. Colin Bunn doing great stuff like uh, Night Temporal. And uh, there's also uh, uh, Killer Groove uh, from Ollie Masters and uh, Owen Meaning. Fantastic, uh, great stuff. Oh, and that, yeah. And uh, that was a really fun L.A. crime book that came out from Aftershock. Uh, Steve Orlando's got a really neat project coming up in the spring. We'll talk about it with Steve when uh, it's uh, closer to publication. Uh, But he talked about it on his last Word Balloon episode. So many great creators under the Aftershock banner. Uh, You know, I'll tell you, they're good tastemakers, man. They they know what to look for in uh, stories from uh, named creators that we all know and respect and uh, already uh, have the confidence in their work. And Aftershock gives them a different platform beyond DC or Marvel work to do some really interesting stuff. Go to their website, check it out. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on how to order their books through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. Thanks again for listening. More great word balloon to come this week. Uh, In fact, pretty fast and furious. We'll have a Monday episode for you. But uh, I wanted to continue this look back 
at cartoons and uh, continue the motif. We will likely do that with a lot of our uh, representations of old word balloon episodes throughout the month of December. I miss Saturday morning and weekend cartoons. I'm bringing this to you on a Sunday morning. There used to be Sunday morning cartoons too. Hell, one of my favorites, Star Trek the Animated Series, was a Sunday morning animated show. But uh, those days are gone, unfortunately. Well, now you, now you don't need them anymore because you can have cartoons 24 hours a day. Don't forget about the Harley Quinn animated special tonight on TBS uh, in between superhero movies. Check your local listings for that time. But if you don't have DC Universe, here's your chance to sample it and uh, see what all the fun is uh, all about with the new Harley Quinn series. And again, reach back if you didn't listen to my interview with Patrick Schumacher, the showrunner for Harley Quinn. Uh, It also features Diedrich Bader, who we heard today as Batman. So thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2019.